shocking scene in Haiti tonight. Bullet casings outside the presidential palace just hours after the president there was assassinated. The interim prime minister tonight calling it a highly coordinated attack by a heavily armed group. The suspects are still at large. And tonight, the search for answers as leaders across the globe are weighing in on the brutal attack and what comes next for the Caribbean country. A grim development tonight in Surfside, nearly two weeks after that condo collapse and with dozens still missing, officials say the rescue efforts have now turned to a recovery operation. And what about the people left behind, the survivors now left to pick up the pieces of what's left of their shattered lives and homes? Flooding, storm surge, and gusty winds tearing through Florida. Residents up to the East Coast are now bracing for Elsa's impact. Our Ginger Z with the very latest on the tropical storm threat now heading north. What areas need to be on high alert tonight? Delta concern. The Delta variant now dominating more than 50% of COVID-19 cases across the country. Some hospitals at the brink again. In Missouri, ventilators running out. What communities can do to convince more Americans to get vaccinated? Plummeting sperm? One study finds the average sperm count has plunged more than 50% since the 70s. Why might this be cause for concern? Our in-depth report. Is that as alarming as it would seem to be? It's very alarming. Sounds like a lot of sperm, 47 million. But actually, once that drops below 40, we see sharp drops. And 10-year controversy. We will be frank, it was racist. That was the message from 30 fellow professors tonight at UNC after their fellow professor, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, was initially denied tenure. What the author says happened and how she's moving forward tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the aftermath of a shocking presidential assassination in Haiti. The president there killed in the dead of night by a team of assassins. Tonight, the country is in a state of siege, and there are serious questions about what comes next, primarily who is in charge and what individuals are responsible for killing President Jovenel Moise. The attack happened around 1 o'clock this morning in the president's private residence in Haiti's capital of Port-au-Prince. Gunmen were reportedly speaking in English and Spanish. Spanish and presented themselves as agents from the U.S. Drug Agency, Drug Enforcement Agency, but they were not. The Haitian First Lady is now in critical condition at a South Florida hospital tonight, airlifted after being shot along with her husband. At the moment, the country's interim prime minister is in charge, but he had just been dismissed by the president and had been set to be replaced this week. The person next in line to succeed the president, the country's chief justice of the Supreme Court, recently died from COVID, and the country has no working parliament. Tonight, President Biden has condemned the attack and says the U.S. is ready to assist Haiti in whatever way it can. Rachel Scott leads us off tonight with more on what comes next. Tonight, Haiti's first lady rushed to Miami by private plane, wheeled out on a stretcher to a waiting ambulance, hours after she and her husband, Haiti's president, Jovenel Luis, were ambushed in their own home. The brutal attack shortly after 1 a.m., a group of heavily armed men breaking in, shooting and killing the 53-year-old head of state. Today, the driveway still covered in shell casings. A neighbor says there was such a barrage of gunfire, it felt like an earthquake. Haiti's ambassador to the U.S. described the assassins as armed commandos who spoke Spanish and English and posed as American DEA agents. It is a well-orchestrated attack. We're talking about uh, mercenaries, foreign mercenaries. Authorities declaring a state of siege, closing the international airport. The busy capital streets emptied out. <laughs> Haiti has long been gripped by political turmoil and unrest. It has the poorest economy in the West. Not a single dose of the COVID vaccine yet distributed. And Moise, who had been ruling by decree for over a year, was facing calls to step down. In the past year, gang violence, murders, and kidnapping have skyrocketed in Haiti. Rights activists allege Moise's government played a role, allowing criminal groups to flourish in neighborhoods where there was opposition. The anger boiling over. And earlier this year, protests erupting. Haitians saying enough. Critics also opposing the constitutional reform Moise was proposing, fearing he would use it to seek a second term. At an event this past May, Moise pushing back on those claims. I have no personal interest in changing the Constitution, he said. The only interest I have is to see my country move towards change and to see my country become governable. 
But now Haitians are left with an uncertain future. We're shocked. Even when we have problems with the president, we can't imagine they would kill him like this. Today, the acting prime minister calling for calm to, quote, make sure the country does not fall into chaos. Now I'm in charge, as you know, as per uh, Haiti's constitution and its article 149. And in Washington, President Biden condemning the assassination. You need a lot more information, but it's, it's just it's very worrisome about the state of Haiti. While in a Miami hospital tonight, Haiti's first lady, Martine Luis, fights for her life. We do hope uh, the, the doctors will find a way to save her life uh, because it would have been a more devastated blow for the country to, to lose the president and his wife at the same time. Rachel Scott joins us now from the White House. And Rachel, the Haitian government tonight is asking for America's help to find the killers. Yeah, we just heard from the acting prime minister of Haiti. He says the big concern right now is he believes that some of the suspects responsible for this attack are still in Haiti tonight. He says that he is now in charge of the government, but the U.S. is calling for free and fair elections by the end of the year, Lindsay. And, and Rachel, the U.S. government also making it very clear tonight that the attackers' claims that they were with the DA are completely false. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right, Lindsay. You have the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Haiti saying tonight that those claims are just completely false. He says that the U.S. has strongly condemned this assassination, calling it a heinous attack. Lindsay? Rachel Scott reporting in for us from the White House. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks. And joining us now to provide more context on this ongoing crisis and the chaos in Haiti is former Haitian Prime Minister Laurent Lamothe. We thank you so much for being here with us. First off, our condolences for all of the upheaval in your home country right now. What was your reaction when you heard of the death of, of the president there? Well, we were, I was completely devastated. And the country is, is the, the people are, are devastated. The, the Haiti is in mourning. It's a sad day for Haiti and for Haitians. And according to the Miami Herald, there are currently only 10 elected officials in the entire country. The interim prime minister has yet to be sworn in, and the head of the Supreme Court died of COVID last week. Is there anything in your constitution that can serve as a sort of roadmap to help navigate this crisis? Well, the, the constitution in, in its article 149 calls for, if in the absence of the president, the Council of Ministers with the existing Prime Minister carries through uh, the, the management of the country until the, the and have 60 days to carry out elections. So since the elections, they were already planned for the 26th of September. So that timeline falls exactly um, right within the framework of uh, for elections. And what security entity is responsible for the safety of the president? Have they given any explanation as to how this happened? Well, um, Haiti has a police force, as you know, that was trained um, by the, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the components were trained by the international community. Um, there is also a special unit uh, for the presidential security that have over, you know, a thousand guards in there. But, you know, the, the news that I have myself uh, you know, straight from the front lines from Haiti is that um, the, the, all the uh, all the mercenaries they're still holed up. So there is 28 of them, and there are 28 Venezuelan nationals. Uh, and out of that, two of them have been arrested, and and the rest, the 26, they're holed up in a home, uh, and and you know basically. So there's a lot of shooting going on still but um you know so, so the good news is you know they've not escaped um and the the initial indications is that all of the mercenaries they're still pulled up and the police is surrounding them we've been hearing that port-au-prince is described as a ghost town at this time in a statement joseph lambert the head of the senate said that the haitian national police and haitian armed forces are in control of the security of the country the president of course was just assassinated how are residents of haiti supposed to feel like things are safe well it's it's a it's a very difficult situation and everybody needs certainly needs to stay calm and uh, need to give the security forces time to do their job there is a state of emergency, um, which will allow, which will give time for the security forces to, you know, do their job and and uh, and certainly can, you know, arrest those foreign mercenaries and understand who 
is the financier of this operation because mercenaries are very expensive and they're paid by, you know, they're certainly paid, so they have to follow the money trail and to get to the perpetrators and to the, to the financiers of this heinous and this, you know, horrific assassination against the country's democratically elected president. And the, and, and the president was leading many fights on many fronts for reforms that he wanted to do in different sectors of the economy. And, uh, and he had received threats. So, you know, he was aware that uh, it was a very, very dangerous and tenuous situation. And, uh, and they carried out um, on, on some of those threats. So now, you know, an, an investigation has to kick in to find out who did it, who paid for it, and for, the, and for those persons to be held accountable. What kind of action would you like to see, if any, from the United States? Well, first of all, the United States is a great ally of Haiti and, um, and, ha and is very supportive of, of the election. So, so one thing is very important is for the electoral process to continue and for Haiti to have you know, elected officials for, for you know, this, in September, in uh, February 7, 2022, to have a new president, a new Congress, um, and elected officials, you know, to to fill some of the voids that are we, that we are seeing right now. So you have, so the U.S. can play a, a very much a leadership role in that aspect, as well as a leadership role uh, in this in this uh, in the security environment of the country. Do you think at all that this crisis could be a, a tipping point that, that forces many on the island to want to leave? Well, I mean, this this was you know, a very well-financed and coordinated attack to kill the president of the country. And that was a targeted attack. It was a hired, it was, it was hired guns um, that carried out this work. The people of Haiti, um, you know, I mean, what they want, they want peace. They want, you know, an environment conducive to be able to find jobs. And, and they want security. So, and, and, I, and, and the, the authorities have to rise to the occasion and, and be able to provide it. And, and, and catching these guys would be an important point to, to get to who's behind it. And that's the key to it. And for this crime not to be, um, you know, not to be let as, you know, the investigation continues, it has, we have to get through it and, and find the people you know, that, that carried this through and that gave the orders. Back in 2015, you were among a group of people barred from the presidential race in Haiti. Obviously, things are quite different now, and it's once again a presidential election year. Might you consider a run? Well, you know, I get asked this question, you know, in every interview that I do. I, and, and what I say is, you know, I, I want to continue to help the country. I want to continue to help Haiti, and I don't think you need to be president or prime minister to do so. Former Haitian Prime Minister Laurent Lamothe, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now to Elsa's impact tonight, the storm roaring ashore along the Gulf Coast. The system making landfall north of Tampa. Cedar Key battered by heavy rain, rough surf, and winds blasting up to 65 miles per hour. Elsa now moving along the coastline, pushing its way further inland. Tornado warnings issued in northern Florida. The system getting ready to take aim at the east coast. Will Reeve is in Florida for us tonight. Tonight, Elsa has the entire East Coast on alert. The storm moving inland after pummeling much of Florida over the past 24 hours. Images now coming in of extensive damage in Jacksonville from a possible tornado. Elsa has just made landfall to the northwest in Taylor County. Here in the Big Bend region, as rains come along, flooding is a major concern. Main road going through Horseshoe Beach is flooded. Got damage to some of the homes. Powerful storm surge inundating coastal roads with seawater, high winds peeling back shingles. In Jacksonville, one person was killed after a tree fell on cars. In Gainesville, flooding rains forcing first responders to carry some people from their homes. Elsa slammed the keys Tuesday, knocking out power to thousands, submerging cars in Fort Myers and toppling huge trees in Hillsborough County. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z in Tampa, just south of where Elsa made landfall. 
just after 4 a.m. and Elsa passed about 50 miles west of Tampa Bay. And you can see the bay with the wind starting to shove in, getting pretty angry. In the waters off Key West, the Coast Guard and a good Samaritan rescuing 15 people after their vessel capsized. Nine people remain missing tonight. Now let's bring in our Ginger Z. Ginger, you're now back from Florida and have beat Elsa back to New York. But it's coming toward us now. The, the storm is, is racing up the eastern seaboard. Time this out for us. It is, and tonight it's all about Georgia getting into that tornado watch. I was actually just on the phone earlier with my sister. She's an officer in the Navy based at Kings Bay. Looks like they had a tornado. There's damage all throughout there, but you can see those outer bands whipping through southeastern Georgia. Savannah finds themselves tonight in that tornado watch. I really think that's the number one threat. Now, heavy rain's going to be the other, and I think you'll see that all the way up to Myrtle Beach, Charleston, uh, Wilmington even starts to get into it. You see the timing there, Thursday, 8 a.m., so by tomorrow morning. Then Thursday night, it moves through the mid-Atlantic. And even as it dies more, you could still see gusts up to 40 for Virginia. Take it back into the ocean, though, and it's trying to regain strength. All it needs is warm ocean water, and it reconstitutes itself as a bit of a tropical storm. So Long Branch or Seabright, Belmar to New York City, East Rockaway through Long Island, and all the way up to the Cape, there are actually tropical storm watches now. So we'll be dealing with the heavy rain and wind, especially for coastal areas through Connecticut, Rhode Island, up to Massachusetts, and this goes through Friday afternoon. We finally, Lindsay, will say goodbye to Elsa by the time we hit the weekend. Already looking forward to saying goodbye, and we haven't even said hello yet. Ginger, thank you. <laughs> And we move now to the devastating building collapse in Surfside, Florida. A grim development tonight as the rescue effort turns to a recovery operation. Emergency workers telling loved ones there was no chance of life in the rubble. Our Victor Akendo has the latest developments. Tonight, the search at the collapsed condo building in Surfside moving to a recovery mission. At this point, we have truly exhausted every option available to us in the search and rescue mission. Officials notifying families as the death toll jumped to at least 54. Today, teams largely spared from the brunt of Elsa as they looked for more than 80 still unaccounted for. Crews digging through the rubble by hand, separating residents' personal items and storing them in buckets. Our first responders have truly searched that pile every single day since the collapse as if they're searching for their own loved ones. The mayor overcome with emotion when translating her remarks in Spanish. Late Tuesday, officials let journalists view the massive pile. This is the closest that we've been able to get to the collapse site. While they've removed some 5 million pounds of concrete and debris, you can see they still have a lot of work ahead. Those who barely made it out of the tower now starting from scratch. So this is, this is your bedroom now? That's my bedroom. 82-year-old Zulia Taub is living in a friend's apartment as the nonprofit Global Empowerment Mission helps her with a long-term solution. Her home of 22 years, all her belongings gone. I came out with a pajama and a house coat. That's it? My purse. It was her dream to retire to Champlain Towers South, and she's determined to rebuild her life in Surfside. This is my community, and I love Florida, and I will love to stay home. We've already been seeing lots of resilience throughout that Surfside community. Victor Akendo joins us now. Victor, how did local officials make that difficult decision to shift this from a search and rescue to a recovery effort? Lindsay, we just heard from the fire chief explaining that this decision was based on science and engineering, not emotion. We also heard that it became apparent that there were no more voids where anyone could survive. Keep in mind, it has now been 14 days under some grueling conditions out here between fires, storms, and the stifling heat. There will be a moment of silence tonight for the victims. Lindsay? Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. Turning now to the coronavirus, the Delta variant is now responsible for more than half of all new cases across the country. And while today New York City honored doctors, nurses and essential workers with a ticker tape parade for their resilience through the worst of the pandemic, hospitals in other parts of the country are overwhelmed with a new surge of patients. Our Stephanie Ramos has this story. In New York City, once the epicenter of the virus, 
a ticker tape parade honoring the frontline workers as doctors and nurses across parts of the country fight the newest threat, the Delta variant. From Missouri to Utah, in Salt Lake City, they're alarmed with what they're seeing. The young people, the pregnant people that are coming in right now with all these problems that are intubated and you know, on death's door, it's, it's hard to see. That's the most concerning thing for me. Months after its last surge, Intermountain Healthcare in Utah now treating a new flow of patients with one thing in common, they're not vaccinated. I have never taken care of a single patient in the ICU on a ventilator who is fully vaccinated. In Missouri, where they've had to bring in nurses from elsewhere and extra ventilators and unvaccinated patients now filling some ICUs to Kentucky, where there is a renewed push to reach the unvaccinated. I'm so glad that's over. Rural clinics hoping word of mouth will ease vaccine fears. Many are listening. I waited a long time. I should have got a long time ago. I talked to some friends of mine. They said, you know, the vaccine may not be 100%. But if you get COVID, you may check. You can die from it. While back in New York City, authorities hope the high rate of vaccinations will hold off the severe cases of the Delta variant. While they honor doctors and nurses. Frontline workers, part of the parade, each of them critical in helping the city get through the pandemic. The parade's Grand Marshal, Nurse Sandra Lindsay, the first person in the country vaccinated, today with a message for others. If you're on the fence, if you have any hesitation, today should serve as a testament that vaccine works. Science will win. Lindsay, some parts of this country, including Missouri, are seeing the Delta variant in 80% of new cases. Dr. Fauci today saying it is critical to get fully vaccinated because the Delta variant is doubling every couple of weeks. And so far, vaccines do hold up against it. Lindsay. The state of Missouri has some of the lowest vaccination rates in the country, and tonight they're experiencing a surge in COVID-19 hospitalization. Some hospitals are even being forced to put out emergency calls for ventilators. Joining us now is Eric Frederick, the chief administrative officer at Mercy Springfield Hospital. Thank you so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Missouri is part of a group of four states where the Delta variant accounts for a staggering 81% of new COVID cases. You've admitted dozens of new COVID patients in the past few days. Do you have the resources at this point right now to deal with this influx of patients? We do. Uh, thank you for asking. We, uh, towards the end of last week, we knew that we were going to be running short on some specific uh, equipment supplies. So we're part of a large health ministry here in the Midwest, and we called out to our colleagues uh, in St. Louis and other areas, and we're able to uh, resupply as we knew we were going to need that. And uh, as of today, um, we stand uh, well supplied and equipped uh, to care for the patients that we have in the hospital. And you've said that we never thought we would be back here, but clearly low vaccination rates are fueling some of the spread. What are your patients saying as far as why they aren't getting the vaccine? So we have conversations with patients now that are saying they wish they had. We've certainly had some of those stories in our hospital, but I think people still feel like this is either not serious enough to warrant getting a vaccine. Uh, there's distrust of the vaccine. Um, people feel that as long as it's under uh, emergency authorization, that they want to see it longer or fully approved to get that confidence in the vaccine. And there are some people that we know just see this as more of a personal choice. And uh, their, you know, their position is they, they will never take a vaccine. And uh, I think the more we ask them, the more they dig in. So it's a variety of answers. But what that all leads to is very low vaccination rates and high hospitalizations for us right now. And as you see the rest of the country now approaching some semblance of normalcy, major cities like New York dropping all COVID restrictions, people going back to work. What's your explanation for the disparity? Is it entirely explained by those who are just not getting vaccinated? I believe so. I think we can all look at that and draw that direct correlation of uh, the low vaccination rates and high hospitalizations. The vaccine's proven to be effective uh, against uh, not only the illness, but hospitalization. So there are certainly are people that are fully vaccinated that get hospitalized, although for us that's been less than 4% of our COVID uh, admissions. Um, and it, But even if they're hospitalized, they're, they're not as sick. We've not had fully vaccinated people in our ICUs level or having a higher level of care that needed when they come to the hospitals. So we just know it's, it's effective against getting sick. It's effective against serious illness and hospitalization. Less than 4% of those getting admitted have been vaccinated, that's right? Correct. And what's the morale like for your doctors and nurses there? 
Yeah, the whole team is tired. We just went through this barely six months ago when we peaked over the winter. I think um, the difference then was the path forward was unsure. Now we have something in hand that can help prevent this, and it's really personal choice that's preventing us from getting there, and that's very frustrating. I think as a healthcare system, you know, we, we look forward and we want to make sure the community is protected. Uh, we took that step today by announcing that we're mandating co-worker vaccines across our ministry, and that's, you know, close to 43,000 co-workers across multiple states, multiple clinics and hospitals. So we think by leading uh, as a large organization, hopefully others will follow us in the community and uh, especially other businesses and, and healthcare systems that will say, yeah, that's the right direction going and we can continue to educate and influence and, and lead the path for the community to, to go towards those vaccinations because they're available and they're free. There's really no, no reason left to get it other than just choosing not to. And you said specifically personal choice, but does it all appear to be political as far as people who are deciding not to get vaccinated? Yeah, I'll just clarify. I, we know that there is certainly a segment of society is not going to be able to get the vaccine for the medical uh, reasons for that. And what we do is encourage people to talk to their physicians, get clarified. But what we see locally, and we know through some research at our hospital association level, that there is uh, a segment of the group of the community that has politicized it, and they they feel like um, you know this is uh, someone else's plan or. They have beliefs about the vaccine and COVID that this is manufactured and not true, and they just won't uh, accept it uh, no matter what, what we say. In my mind, it's, you know, this is a vaccine that was brought to market by a Republican president, and it's being delivered by a Democratic president. It's, uh, it's a bipartisan effort. I've ever seen one. Uh, they both got the vaccine. They're both doing fine. I, I don't understand how people still stand on one side or the other and say this is the issue, but we clearly see that in our community. Is there a lesson that the rest of the country can take from what's happening in Missouri right now? Continue to encourage vaccines because this could be your community. If you look at our vaccination rates and compare them to your own vaccination rates, that, that that's the uh, I think that's the case study that we're kind of presenting to the entire country right now. We're we're busy this time of year. It's a busy community. Um, we want people to enjoy uh, being together and doing the things they want to do, but vaccinate yourself that's that's really the way forward so if you're in an area with lower vaccination rates uh, look at us or look at places that have high vaccination rates and um, you can pretty easily draw that conclusion that vaccines are the way to go well perhaps people are taking note of what is happening there in the show me state of missouri mercy springfield hospital chief administration officer eric frederick we thank you so much for your time tonight thank you appreciate your time and when we come back, the disturbing video, a partially blind woman strip searched by officers and left naked in a jail cell. We speak with the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist initially deny the 10 year recognition that so many of her white counterparts at UNC received, why she chose to go to Howard instead. But up next, the silent crisis, sperm counts in many Western nations are down on top of the stigma attached with the issue. Our in-depth look coming up next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 
This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back, everybody. We turn now to male infertility. It's an affliction that many struggle with in silence, and we could be headed toward a crisis. Researchers have found that male sperm count has plummeted by 50% since the 1970s, but why? ABC's Trevor Olt has this report. There are many ways to measure a man. Brian Mazza, an entrepreneur and fitness influencer featured twice on the cover of Men's Health Mexico, checks a lot of the traditional boxes. But on this day back in December, as Brian finished a 50-mile ultramarathon, he was thinking about something that at one time made him feel like less of a man. Thank you guys so much for the support. We raised over $63,000. That money will go toward fertility treatments for families struggling to conceive, an issue that pushed Brian and his wife Chloe's marriage to its limits as Brian learned he was the problem. It was really hard until then when we finally got checked and it was like, er, the record stopped and it was like, time out, guys. We have a larger issue here and it's with Brian. How did you feel when you got that news? It was really hard for me to look at myself in the mirror and, and be like, wow, I have this issue. I don't know why I have this issue, what's going on, what's contributing to it. I didn't fully understand it because no guys ever talk about it. Um, I didn't know any other guy who had this issue. So I didn't know who to turn to. Like many men, Brian at first kept his fertility struggles a secret, not even telling his own family out of a deeper sense of shame or fear. But eventually, he and Chloe decided it was time to open up, sharing their struggles on social media. It was really remarkable how many guys reached out to me on social saying, I'm going through the same thing. I feel the same way. In fact, a male factor is identified in 35% of couples with infertility. But let's face it, talking publicly about your sperm can often be awkward or taken as a joke. Brian is making it his mission to destigmatize the topic, something many scientists are in favor of. You know, you'd go to a cocktail party. You'd talk about, oh, I went to the doctor, I got a high cholesterol, I better walk, not eat this dip, right? But you wouldn't say, oh, I went to the doctor and my sperm count is low. I think getting this discussion out there is a good thing. Dr. Shanna Swan is an environmental and reproductive epidemiologist, the author of Countdown, How Our Modern World is Threatening Sperm Counts, Altering Male and Female Reproductive Development, and Imperiling the Future of the Human Race. Her team collected and analyzed nearly 200 studies of more than 40,000 men, and they found in Western countries from 1973 to 2011, the average sperm count decreased from 99 million per milliliter to 47. 7 million, a drop of more than 50%, and a pace that, if it were to continue, could have an enormous impact. Is that as alarming as it would seem to be? It's very alarming. Sounds like a lot of sperm, 47 million. But actually, once that drops below 40, we see sharp drops in fertility. What do you think this means for the future of human reproduction. It's going to take longer and longer to conceive a pregnancy. More and more people are have to go to assisted reproduction, which is already happening. And fewer men are going to have adequate sperm of the quality needed for sperm banks. And that's happening as well. 
Multiple factors may be causing these trends, and they are very much up for debate, but they generally fall under two categories, lifestyle and environment. Things like smoking, drinking, stress, obesity, and age have all been shown to potentially affect fertility, but Dr. Swan says certain chemicals pervasive in our environment are also having an impact. They're called endocrine disrupting chemicals. These chemicals are found in products many of us use every day, from things like electronics to plastics, even cosmetics and food packaging. Dr. Patricia Hunt, a geneticist at Washington State University, studied their impact and their prevalence. The reason they're called that is because they have the ability to mimic or interfere with our body's hormones. These chemicals can alter the formation of organs and organ systems in the fetus and change behavior and influence things like our reproductive ability. Is it even possible to avoid them or are they that pervasive that it's kind of a foregone conclusion? It is impossible to avoid them. Um, you know, it is possible to limit your exposure to some of them by making choices and, and changing your lifestyle a bit, but we can't really avoid them. Dr. Hunt and her lab studied the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals on mice, and they found that not only would it affect the fertility of the mice who were exposed, but those changes would be passed down. If that individual's father, grandfather, even great-grandfather was exposed, our data would indicate this, the effects are much more severe. So it kind of increases with each generation? Yeah, it's kind of a, a snowballing effect or a train wreck. Dr. Hunt says after three generations of being exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals, one in five of the male mice were infertile. Of course, humans are not mice and more research is needed. There are currently no peer reviewed studies that show such endocrine disrupting chemicals cause low sperm counts in humans. We have lots of requirements for ingredients, no requirements for what the packaging is made of. Consumers can make good choices if they're educated. So I'd like to see some package labeling that would allow them to make decisions. But regardless of the cause, a growing number of men like Brian Mazza are grappling with infertility, what it means for their families and how they see themselves. To a man finding out today that he is the cause of fertility problems in his relationship, what would your message be to him? My message would be very simple to him, that you're not less of a man. You're not less of anything you think you are or what anyone is saying. So now let's identify those issues and just know that there is help along the way that can give you some hope and that can assist you in achieving your dreams as being a dad. And there is help. Today, in vitro fertilization accounts for as much as 3% of births in the U.S. and Europe. And while Brian and Chloe acknowledge it can be expensive and it isn't always successful, Hi guys. Hey. Hey. it's allowed him to become the father of two beautiful boys. We actually have pictures of their embryos in their room from the process of IVF. There's no shame in it. When times are rough and when I'm tired, or when we're exhausted, or when they're screaming, and the, and the life is so hectic. I say to my wife sometimes, and she says to me sometimes, like, we almost didn't have this. For ABC News, I'm Trevor Alt in New York. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the sentence handed down to the teen convicted for the death of an Uber Eats driver, and why the popularity of secondhand clothes surged during the pandemic. We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day, Teletubbies, they are now vaccinated. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Right. Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. With pandemic restrictions lifting, many Americans want some new threads. They want to refresh their wardrobes, and we are seeing a clothing purge along with a spike in shopping. We take a look by the numbers. The secondhand clothing business is booming, expected to double from $36 billion to $77 billion in 2025, according to the AP. The luxury resale site Real Real, which now has more than 20 million members, says sales are up 53% compared to last year. Secondhand retailer Thread Red Up estimates that there are 9 billion clothing items that are hardly worn sitting in our closets right now, ready to be resold. Meanwhile, demand for clothing is surging. The top three retail items that Americans want to buy in the coming months are apparel, footwear, and beauty supplies, according to the market research firm NPD Group. That's ahead of consumer technology, home goods, and event tickets and travel. And many Americans are ready to ditch the sweats and athleisure that became staples, really, during the pandemic. Sales of women's dress have actually spiked 50% compared to the same week in 2019. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. The young woman who filmed the death of George Floyd is now dealing with a personal tragedy, and it involves the police. We'll explain. Former President Trump is going after social media giants for claiming that they violated his First Amendment rights. Does he have a case? And the snake on the loose in a mall. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world
world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier Podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. President Biden says the U.S. is monitoring the situation in Haiti and needs to learn more after the assassination of Haitian President Jovenel Moise. ABC News has learned he was killed in his home. Haitia's ambassador to the U.S. and the attackers may have fled the country. Interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph condemned the attack but says the National Police Force has the situation under control. The Haitian authorities are trying to project an air of calm and security in the country at this hour. The country's first lady was shot She's hospitalized in critical but stable condition. Today, in conjunction with the America First Policy Institute, I'm filing as the lead class representative a major class action lawsuit against the big tech giants, including Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Trump held a news conference at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey, to say the three companies violated his First Amendment rights after they censored his post. The social media giants banned the former president in the wake of the deadly January 6th riot at the Capitol. The company's saying they feared he would incite his followers to commit more acts of violence. Former President Trump joined by other plaintiffs in the suit, which were filed in federal court in Miami. A 14-year-old has been sentenced to seven years in juvenile detention for her role in the death of Washington, D.C. Uber Eats driver Mohamed Anwar. The teen pleaded guilty to second-degree murder after being seen using a stun gun on Anwar along with another teen. The 14-year-old will be held in juvie until she is 21. Her accomplice was given the same sentence a month earlier. A sheriff's office in Macomb County, Illinois, is facing major backlash over a disturbing video released of a woman being strip searched by officers in 2019. The video obtained by a FOIA request by the Democratic women of McDonough County shows Ariel Harrison, who is black and partially blind, having her clothing removed by three officers, including two male officers, and being left naked in a jail cell. Harrison was initially detained for allegedly driving recklessly. Harrison tells Vice she was afraid to follow the order to undress for fear of being sexually assaulted. In a statement to ABC News, the county sheriff says Harrison was attempting to commit suicide and the correctional staff intervened to keep her from harming herself. The statement goes on to say, quote, the correctional staff followed the appropriate safety procedures in training and handling the incident. The sheriff also says the video was reviewed by the McDonough State's attorney and no legal violations were found. The uncle of Darnella Frazier, the teen who recorded the viral video of George Floyd's death at the knee of a Minneapolis police officer, was killed in a crash that involved a police car. The teen writing on Facebook, I woke up to the most horrible news. Minneapolis police killed my uncle, my uncle. Another black man lost his life in the hands of the police. Laniel Frazier died in the three-car crash after police were pursuing another vehicle that was believed to be involved in multiple robberies. The Hennepin County medical examiner who confirmed Frazier's identity says he died from multiple blunt force injuries. The crash is being investigated by Minnesota State Patrol. 
Well, the search is on for a snake that got out of its enclosure at the Blue Zoo. But here's the thing. The Blue Zoo is located inside the Mall of Louisiana. The Burmese python is about 12 feet long and not poisonous. Officials say the snake is actually used often with children in their shows. The zoo has acquired night vision resources for their search because the snake is nocturnal. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones made headlines two years ago when the New York Times published the 1619 Project with her exploration of the legacies of slavery that continue today. Hannah-Jones was recently poised to make history as the first ever African-American to be named night chair for race and investigative journalism at her alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill. But there was initially pushback from conservatives, including a prominent donor who objected to Hannah-Jones's work. As a result, the university's board declined to award her tenure some Something all of the past white chairs had been given. Under intense pressure then, the UNC Board of Trustees finally agreed to give Hannah Jones tenure, but yesterday she turned down their offer and instead she will join the faculty of Howard University. Nicole Hannah Jones joins us now. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. So you released a four-page statement explaining your decision to turn down UNC in which you wrote, uh, at some point when you've proven yourself and fought your way into institutions that were not built for you, when you've proven that you can compete and excel at the highest level, you have to decide that you are done forcing yourself in. Did you ever at all have the expectation that your confirmation to tenure would be so controversial or were you completely blindsided by the initial decision? I, no, I had no idea. Uh, I had been recruited for this position for a couple of years by Dean Susan, Susan King, uh, who heads the journalism school there. I'm an alum of uh, University of North Carolina School of Journalism. Uh, I've received numerous awards from the university, including being inducted into the North Carolina Media Hall of Fame. And I have, you know, the same or matching uh, or, you know, in some ways, an excess of the uh, credentials and awards of the other people who have held that position. So um, I went through the tenure process. The faculty who had the expertise to judge uh, my worthiness for tenure unanimously approved my tenure. Uh, and it was uh, the political appointees uh, at the Board of Trustees that stopped it. So I, no, I had no idea. I, I certainly believed that I was uh, as qualified as anyone else who had received tenure in that position before. And, and explain to our viewers why tenure matters. Well, tenure matters for exactly the reason that I didn't initially receive it, which is tenure is a protection um, that allows for full academic freedom. It means that uh, people, uh, professors cannot be punished and penalized for the work that they do. Oftentimes, uh, uh, academics are doing research and producing work that can be seen as controversial or that challenges the status quo. And this protects the ability to pursue work that may not be popular with people who are politically powerful. So the fact that I was initially denied tenure, uh, largely because of the nature of my works, uh, specifically around conservative objections to the 1619 Project, speaks to why I could not come to the university without it. And twice the UNC Board of Trustees declined to vote on offering you tenure and only did so last week, days before you were set to start. Uh, you wrote that times like these demand courage and those who have held the most power in this situation have exhibited the least of it. What message do you feel that UNC's leadership has sent to black scholars, not only on their campus, but across the country? Well, I think what, you know, the Board of Trustees not voting was one thing, but to also have the chancellor and the provost of the university fail to speak out publicly, fail to say that the board of trustees should have treated me like every other professor uh, who came in under the night chair, I think that sent the message to other faculty on campus that they would not have the protection and the support of administration if it came down to a fight with political appointees. I think it showed that there was not a respect for what black faculty go through on campus and that they need to have uh, the stated and public support and the courage of leadership when our work is challenged. So we know that faculty got that message. We know that the University of North Carolina uh, lost some recruits over this, that other black uh, faculty are considering leaving the university. And I think one of the reasons that 
this um, case of mine became such a big deal. It's faculty all across the country, black faculty, faculty that come from other marginalized groups, um, said that if they were able to do this to me, I work at the New York Times, I have a huge megaphone, I have a huge platform. Um, what do they think they could get away with when it came to uh, lesser known scholars who have been doing this work for a long time, but may not be able to draw the attention uh, when they're treated unfairly? And you talk about what black faculty goes through on campus. As you know, the story of prominent black scholars being denied tenure is not new. Uh, we certainly interviewed Professor Cornell West, who left Harvard after not getting tenure, as well as Dr. Paul Harris, who has since left UVA even after they granted him tenure. And if we were to talk about black female professors in particular at four year colleges, according to the Chronicle for Higher Education, they account for only 2.1 percent of tenured professors. How do you explain the disparity? Well, it, in some ways, it becomes a, a kind of self-replicating. So on any college campus, typically, the people who can vote for tenure are only full professors who already have tenure. So if we have universities that for decades were only really tenuring white men um, and then started to tenure white women, those are the people who are ultimately deciding the worthiness of the scholarship. And if black uh, scholars are doing scholarship in areas of race or inequality or the black experience, that is often not valued the same as other types of scholarship. And so that gatekeeping is what is often keeping black scholars from getting tenure. So at the University of North Carolina, I would have not only been the first black night chair, I would have been the first uh, full professor who was a black woman in the 70 year history of that school. There's only been one black woman tenured in the 70 year history of that school. So while my case is, is a big case in that it got a lot of attention, these issues are longstanding. And I tried to make clear in my letter, uh, my open letter, that simply resolving my issue doesn't resolve the larger obstacles and discrimination that black faculty and particularly black women scholars face all across this country. And so I hope that other universities uh, who might find it easy to, to point at the Board of Trustees in North Carolina and say, well, they're just backwards, uh, would do some real uh, internal uh, introspection on the way that they are also uh, blocking so many talented black faculty who have dedicated their life uh, to academia from this very important protection, protection and also prestige on the campus. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look at it. Mount Etna erupting at a distance with the town of Catania, Italy, right below it. This is a very active volcano. The 46th time this volcano has erupted just in 2021. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. In our next hour, we're staying on top of several things, including the Russian-led cyber attacks. Will the Biden administration respond? And our conversation with the 12-year-old who is probably a lot smarter than all of us. He is a grandmaster at chess. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Tropical Storm Elsa moving into southern Georgia as Tropical Storm watches now extend all the way up to Massachusetts. Elsa is expected to bring heavy rain and flooding up the East Coast through Friday. A moment of silence at the site of the Surfside building collapse after the search and rescue efforts have now shifted to a recovery mission. First responders broke the devastating news to family members today, telling them there was no chance chance of life. Currently, there are more than 50 confirmed deaths and still nearly 90 people unaccounted for. Renowned filmmaker Robert Downey Sr., the father of Robert Downey Jr., has died at the age of 85. Downey Jr. confirmed the news via Instagram, calling his father a true maverick filmmaker. Downey Sr. had been battling Parkinson's disease for more than five years. He passed away in his sleep at his home in New York. We are also following a developing situation in Haiti tonight. The Haitian president assassinated inside his residence. The first lady was shot and critically wounded. The ambassador calling the killers well-trained commandos. President Biden condemning the attack, calling it a heinous act. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, Haiti's first lady rushed to Miami by private plane, wheeled out on a stretcher to a waiting ambulance. Hours after she and her husband, Haiti's president, Jovenel Moise, were ambushed in their own home. The brutal attack shortly after 1 a.m., a group of heavily armed men breaking in, shooting and killing the 53-year-old head of state. Today, the driveway still covered in shell casings. A neighbor says there was such a barrage of gunfire, it felt like an earthquake. Haiti's ambassador to the U.S. described the assassins as armed commandos who spoke Spanish and English and posed as American DEA agents. It is a well-orchestrated attack. We're talking about uh, mercenaries, foreign mercenaries. Authorities declaring a state of siege, closing the international airport, the busy capital streets emptied out. <laughs> Haiti has long been gripped by political turmoil and unrest. It has the poorest economy in the West. Not a single dose of the COVID vaccine yet distributed. Muiz had been ruling by decree for over a year and was facing calls to step down. Security pays uh, sous control. Today, the acting prime minister calling for calm to, quote, make sure the country does not fall into chaos. In Washington, President Biden condemning the assassination. We need a lot more information, but it's, it's just, it's very worrisome about the state of Haiti. While in a Miami hospital tonight, Haiti's first lady, Martine Moise, fights for her life. We do hope uh, the, the doctors will find a way to save her life uh, because it would have been a more devastated blow for the country to, to lose the president and his wife at the same time. Our thanks to Rachel for that. Days after the massive ransomware attack that crippled hundreds of businesses over the holiday weekend, we're learning a different group also bridged computers owned by a vendor for the Republican National Committee. President Biden met with national security experts today to discuss details of these recent cyber attacks and the administration's plans moving forward. ABC's Faith Abube has the latest on that. 
Right now, the extent of damage from the ransomware attack on Miami-based IT software company Kaseya is still under review. And now, ABC News confirming that over the weekend, cyber criminals also hit a vendor that works with the Republican National Committee. The RNC insisting its computers were not directly hacked and that their data was not accessed. The attacks were just the latest in a growing number of cyber assaults on U.S. entities. The president meeting behind closed doors with the intelligence community, discussing ways to stop the hackers. We're getting more detail and information, but that's what I can tell you now. And uh, I feel good about uh, our ability to... Uh while it's unclear who's behind the new round of cyber attacks, experts have linked some of them to Russia-based hacking groups, including the ransomware attacks on JBS Foods, Colonial Pipeline, and the hack of SolarWinds. It's clear that these organizations are acting with impunity, largely from in organizations and places that are really within the, the reach and control of the Russian state. As the president made clear to President Putin when they met, if the Russian government cannot or will not take action against criminal actors residing in Russia, we will take action uh, or reserve the right uh, to take action uh, on our own. In a joint bulletin obtained by ABC News, federal authorities warning the Russian intelligence agency, GRU, is also making its own hacking attempts, using brute force to try to access hundreds of government and private sector computer systems. Our thanks to Faith for that. And now to news tonight about the select committee in the House of Representatives to investigate January 6th. Sources tell ABC News House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy will in fact appoint Republicans to the committee, though it's unclear right now just who. Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced last week that Democrats would move forward in creating the select committee after Republicans blocked a bipartisan proposal for an independent bipartisan commission. McCarthy hadn't initially decided whether he would appoint anyone at all. Republican Liz Cheney has already accepted Nancy Pelosi's invitation. Now to the lawsuits filed by former President Donald Trump against Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube owner Google. The social media giants banned Trump from their platforms following the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Trump in Bedminster, New Jersey today had this to say. I stand before you this morning to announce a very important and very beautiful, I think, development for our freedom and our freedom of speech. We're demanding an end to the shadow banning, a stop to the silencing, and a stop to the blacklisting, banishing, and canceling that you know so well. Our case will prove this censorship is unlawful, it's unconstitutional, and it's completely un-American. And to help unpack these cases, we bring in First Amendment attorney Floyd Abrams from the law firm Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell. We thank you so much, Mr. Abrams, for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here. So Trump says that these big tech companies violate his First Amendment right to free speech, and one lawsuit argues that Facebook is akin to a government entity. Does Trump have any chance of winning these cases? I don't think he's got any chance. I, I think it's a, a zero matter in terms of chances of success. Uh, he wants to denounce Facebook uh, and its competitors. This may be the best way, or he thinks it is. But as a legal matter, it's inside out. The First Amendment protects against the government, the government saying who can speak and who can't speak. And what, what former President Trump is saying is he wants to get a federal judge to say, in effect, put him on, put him on. Now, that's the opposite of the First Amendment. Uh, Facebook has First Amendment rights. Uh, Twitter has First Amendment rights. And those rights include something like ABC does or the uh, New York Times does to make a decision of who they want to have in their different fields, on the air, in their newspaper, on broadcasting, et cetera. So uh, I think that it is flatly contrary to the most central feature of the First Amendment. The central feature is it is up to the entities that are speaking to decide who speaks with them, the entities that own a newspaper, the entities that own Facebook. To, to make their decision, which one can criticize, of course, but it's their decision about who to put on and, and, and to import 
the government to say, I want a court order requiring this, is at odds with the absolute center, center piece of the First Amendment. And Trump also challenges the law that gives these social media companies immunity from being sued over content posted on their platforms. Is it true that they're allowed to censor some speech and not others? It is true that they're allowed to make, in the journalistic world, we would say editorial decisions. It is true that they're allowed to make the decision of not, not carrying someone on their platform who they think is dangerous or offensive for one reason or another. Now, in that situation, yes, Congress has gone farther than the First Amendment to protect these then new entities of what became the Internet, what became Facebook, et cetera. And the idea of that was to, to get it going, to be, because we want more, not less, speech as a generality. And if Facebook has to check out every time someone says something which could be libelous, when they didn't ask them to be on, people put something on Facebook, uh, then we're not going to have anything like the, the sort of Internet that we have now. But that's not because of the First Amendment. Congress did that. Congress can repeal it. Uh, and, and it is not required by the First Amendment. The First Amendment, the message of the First Amendment is basically stay away. You're not allowed to tell us what to do. But if Congress chooses to make a decision that it's in the public interest to protect Facebook and the like in an area like this, uh, it doesn't violate the Constitution for them to do so. And platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube clearly have enormous power over public speech. Do you think that that's at all cause for concern? I do think they have enormous power. I don't even think that's debatable. The way we deal with that, if we choose to deal with it as a public, is through the antitrust laws, through laws which say, in some circumstances, companies are so big, so powerful, so much a monopoly, which Facebook really isn't, but one can argue about the, the power and the like of, of large entities, these enormous entities with enormous power. That's all true. Um, but the way to deal with that is not to force them to put someone on or to carry someone on its platform. The way to deal with that, if, if the Congress representing the people decided, is, is to crack down based on size or influence. And if they have to change the antitrust laws, if they choose to, they could do that. But what they can't do is violate the First Amendment. And finally, President Trump says that he's suing to protect everyone's freedom, not just his own. Do you buy that? I mean, could these lawsuits actually move the needle on, on free speech protections? Uh, it could move the needle, but it would move the needle against First Amendment protection. It would move the needle against it because it would involve the government saying, in effect, the Donald Trumps of the world have to be allowed on even if there's a decision made by the people that run Facebook that he's advocating the insurrection. I mean, these companies, Facebook, for example, that they don't, that they say they don't, they try not to carry racist speech. Some of that speech is First Amendment protected when the government tries to ban it. But Facebook is allowed to do that. Indeed, they have a First Amendment right to do that. And the same is true when, when Facebook makes a decision, like it or not, think it's a good idea or not, when Facebook makes a decision that, that look, what, what then President Trump is saying is so dangerous to the world, we don't want it on our platforms. They have the right to do that. Mr. Abrams, a man described by one former senator as the most significant First Amendment lawyer of our age. We appreciate your insight and your time tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here. Tonight, the city of Chicago is dealing with an alarming surge in shootings. Two federal agents and a police officer shot and wounded while working undercover. Chicago police say more than 100 people were shot over the holiday weekend. Today, President Biden met with the Chicago mayor. Alex Perez reports in. A chaotic scene in Chicago, authorities scrambling after three officers were shot. We need an ambulance. We've got three POs 
The frantic scene playing out in the early morning hours. Two ATF agents and one Chicago police officer working undercover in an unmarked vehicle when they came under fire. At 5.50 a.m. this morning, officers were fired upon uh, from the street towards the on-ramp while they were in their car. Dozens of first responders on the scene. The injuries, thankfully, authorities say, not life-threatening. And tonight, detectives are questioning a person of interest. According to the city's top cop, 36 Chicago police officers have been shot or shot at this year already. This is a very challenging time uh, to be in law enforcement, but they are rising to the challenge, uh, doing all they can. This morning's shooting comes on the heels of a violent 4th of July weekend in Chicago. More than 100 people shot, at least 18 killed. Now some local officials asking the feds for help. Our communities are under siege. Our police officers are under siege. They're outmanned and they're outgunned. And Lindsay, as you know, President Biden is in town. He met briefly with Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. We're told the two talked about federal help that's expected to arrive soon. Special teams dispatched to tackle gun violence here in this city and cities across the country. As for those three officers who were shot, Lindsay, they have been released from the hospital. Lindsay? Some good news there, Alex. Thank you. With food costs rising across the country, supermarkets are now stockpiling certain items, working to stay ahead of big price increases. Here's ABC sees Stephanie Ramos with the details. During the peak of the pandemic, shoppers struggled to find the groceries or household products they wanted because people were stockpiling items like toilet paper, hand soap, and other household goods. Now, store shelves are filled and it's the grocery stores that are stockpiling. But why? It's called hedging. The retailers are trying to protect their margins and that's why they're bringing in extra inventory. But it's 20 to 25% some of these retailers are bringing in of, of extra inventory. Brands like Campbell Soup, General Mills, J.M. Smucker have announced they are raising prices due to supply chain and transportation issues, a sign other companies may follow suit. People are buying more, and then your restaurants are opening up. It's, again, caused this, uh, this demand that we haven't seen before in the past. According to USDA data, the consumer price index for grocery store food purchases last year was up 3.5%, well above the 20-year annual average of 2% and the highest annual increase since 2011. I think the pandemic was a catalyst um, to the supply chain issues that we see now. So the best advice? Experts say shop at multiple stores for the best deal. And if you see a great deal, buy a few extra to put in the pantry. Some good tips there. Our thanks to Stephanie. And still to come, could all fans be barred from the upcoming Olympics because of the surge of COVID in Japan? And our conversation with the 12-year-old grandmaster of chess. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hug you. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? So what would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. Surging COVID-19 cases in Tokyo have hit a two-month high that almost guarantees the Japanese government will declare a new state of emergency to start next week and continue for the duration of the Tokyo Olympics. The new state of emergency could lead to a ban even on local fans. The decision on fans is expected to be made by Friday when local organizers meet with the International Olympics Committee. Tense moments in Dubai after a large blast caused buildings to shake across the city. The cloud of fire broke out in a container on a ship anchored at a port. Thankfully, no deaths or injuries were reported, and officials later said the fire was under control. Roger Federer, the eight-time Wimbledon champ, is officially out of the competition. A major upset for the world-renowned champ who lost in straight sets. When asked if he plans on retiring, he said, quote, I hope not. Last year, the tennis star underwent two operations on his right knee. Today was a celebratory day in New York City. The essential workers who got the city through the pandemic were honored with a ticker tape parade. ABC's Rena Roy has more from Manhattan. After a dark year and a half in New York City, a big party in the heart of Manhattan for the hometown heroes. Cannons of confetti, loud music, and cheers filling the once quiet streets. New Yorkers smiling with gratitude in a sign that the worst is now behind us. For people to be out here beating the heat to celebrate us, I'm just so honored. Queen's nurse Sandra Lindsay led the parade as Grand Marshal after making history as the first person in the United States to get vaccinated back in December. I feel so proud. Such progress has been made, and we need to just keep it going. Thank you, New York. 14 floats, 13 marching bands, and 2,500 essential workers made it one of the largest ticker tape parades in the city's history. A big thank you to the healthcare workers, first responders, grocery and transit workers, and so many more who kept things running. I was really scared out there. It makes me feel great and relatively that we survived it. Some MTA workers cruising along Broadway in a 118-year-old subway car that was actually in service during the pandemic in 1918. The men and women on this bus have served the city through thick and thin for so long. It's just wonderful to see the city come out and thank our workers. It's just really touching. Mayor Bill de Blasio riding on a float with hospital workers and addressing the crowds outside City Hall in the scorching summer sun. Thank you to the nurses. Thank you to the doctors. Thank you to the technicians. Everybody who makes the hospitals work in this crisis. You are heroes. Our thanks to Rena for that. And now to a remarkable story of a young talent who is wise beyond his years and has all the right moves on the chessboard. That was two and a half year old Abhimanyu Mishira immaculately setting up his chessboard for a friendly competition with his dad. Ten years later, he is breaking records and is the youngest grandmaster of chess. Abhi is kind enough to join us tonight from Budapest, Hungary. Thank you so much for being here. First off, congratulations on your grand accomplishment. Thank you. So impressive. Take us back to the moment that you made history. What was your reaction? It was it was amazing. I mean, when I when I finally got it, uh, staying here for two and a half three months, it, it was amazing. I was very relieved and happy, and a lot of feelings went through at that time. Did you have the vision ahead of time, like I am going to get this? Yeah, I mean, we've been we've been planning this for a, for a very very long time now. For the last few tournaments, I've been miss, uh, I've been missing it marginally, and finally to break it is it, it, I was very very happy. And you said for some time now. Walk us through the training process. How many hours and days did you practice leading up to the competition? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, for the last ever since Corona started, 
I've been working. I've I've been working at least twelve hours a day on this. Wow. And and of course, uh, during the, the during the pandemic, there was nothing much to do otherwise. So I just kept on working and and for and because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to play it. I wasn't able to play many games for fourteen months, and that that slowed down the process a lot, of course. So. And that time I used for training, and that definitely helped, and I was able to break it. When you couldn't train with people, are you just using the computer, or are you training with Dad? I'm training with my coach, Oren Fasad Subramaniam. No, my dad's not exactly my main coach currently, but, yeah, he was before. I mean, he's he, now, mainly, now mainly he's my goal setter. <laughs> Got it. He and tells he's... me what... what What's needed? What's needed to go to the next level? And I, I follow whatever he says, and it's working completely. <laughs> He's been with you the entire way. Tell us what it's been like just to spend this and have this quality time with Dad. I mean, it's very, it's it's a very, it's a very fun game to be, to, a very fun game, and uh, it's yeah, it's amazing. And, and so you the, love the you love the game of chess. Was this something that your dad first introduced you to? Yes, when I was two and a half, he he told me how to, like he, he taught me how to move the pieces and all the rules. And by the age of five, I was able to start playing tournaments. I did an interview many years ago with Peter Thiel, who was the co-founder of PayPal, and he also was a very young uh, grandmaster of chess. And we were playing a game, and he told me after I made a move, he said, that's a bad idea. A knight on the rim is dim, that you don't want to put your knight on the edge. Do you have any advice that you might want to impart to a struggling chess player like myself? I mean, my best advice is, I mean, this doesn't just apply to chess, it, it applies to everything, is if you don't, if you don't put in the hours, nothing will happen. I mean, if you, you can't just, you can't just play casually. If you put in the, if you put in the hours and you do all the hard work and, and the more hard work you do, the more results you get. That's my idea. That's great advice. At seven years old, you were the youngest U.S. chess expert. At 10 years old, you were the youngest international master. And now you are the youngest grandmaster. What's next for you? I mean, where do you go from here? From here, my, my next goal is to become 2700 super grandmaster. The final goal is to become world champion. I want to rule the, I want to rule the world the way uh, great Bobby Fischer did back in the day. My next goal is 2700 FIDE, top 30 in the world. And for that, I mean, Currently, my, my parents, they've put in all their savings uh, for to get me up to here. And things were so bad at the point that we had to start a GoFundMe. So I'm, I'm requesting all the, and, and I don't, I've broken all the youngest ever records, the, in national, uh, the national records, the youngest expert and youngest master, and the two, and two international records. And currently, we don't have a corporate sponsor. I'm requesting all the viewers to help. All right, Avi. Well, we hope that you get that help and that you be, are able to rule the chess board and the world, as you say. Thank you. Good luck to you, and thanks so much for talking with us tonight. Thank you. All the best to him. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. When it matters most, the straightforward